Okay, so welcome to the second shiur on Ger Katan, on the conversion of babies. Um, we're going to start with a little bit of an introduction um, to some historical unique features that are important to understand before um, we look into the particular question that we're going to raise today um, and next week. And the reason why this is important, and this is important for the conversion of adults as well, is that we're living in a world in a, in a world in a, of modernity in which people have more choices than anybody could have imagined 250 years ago, choices about um, what to wear, where to live, what job to have, uh, what to eat. Um, the number of choices that we make on a regular basis far surpasses anybody in the pre-modern pre world. When you lived in a pre-modern world, you were born into a certain family, in a certain setting, in a, into a church, into a synagogue community, um, into a class typically. And that was kind of where you lived and your world was relatively small. You know, you had your nuclear family and maybe a village, but it wasn't like a huge, you know, international interconnected universe that we're very much used to. And so when somebody converted in the, in the pre-modern world, they would just observe based on the community that they saw. And so it wasn't like today, Jews can choose any number of different streams or stripes or denominations what does shabbat look like or what does a shabbat not look like this is not to say that everybody in the pre-modern world was so from it's just that the community had an expected set of standards and you basically stuck to those standards i don't know what people believed in their heart of hearts i don't know how careful everybody was with their with their bow on their watermelon seeds but they just kind of observed as a community um and so we're living in a world where now there are all these options. So the questions that we're asking, that we want to ask, like, for example, what happens if an adult or a child is being converted into a family system in which it is not reasonable to expect that there will be Shemar Shabbat or Shemar Kashrut, um, but that's just not the family that we're talking about. That wasn't like a reality until, you know, 200 years ago or so. Um, and so the questions that we're asking are not questions that they were asking. One more piece of the puzzle, which is a very important piece for conversion in general, is the difference between status and identity. In the pre-modern world, as a general rule of thumb, your status drove your identity. Status is something that is given to you from outside of you, from the law, uh, from your parents. It's something that you inherit. It's something objective and external. Your identity is what you perceive yourself. So your status in the pre-modern world is what would typically or almost always drive your identity. You were born a Jew, you were born a Christian, you were born a knight, whatever you were born into a particular station of life. So your status would drive your identity. Part of what makes the modern world fun, exciting, complicated is that your status doesn't always drive your identity. Um, you could have been born to Jewish parents and choose not to live a Jewish life. Or if you could have been born to Christian parents and choose to live a Jewish life. Or you, you could be born wealthy and end up poor. You could be born poor and end up wealthy. Right? That's part of, the, part of the reality of our world is that status doesn't always drive, doesn't always drive, identi drive identity. And part of the complications of conversion is that we're living in a world where sometimes somebody's identity and their status aren't actually aligned. What I mean by that is you could have somebody who converted in community X and community Y doesn't recognize that conversion. So their self-identity and their status from community X is I'm Jewish. And they show up at the door of some other rabbi or some other community. And now all of a sudden that community doesn't accept their identity, does not perceive their status to be correct. And that's part of the, the crisis um, and the sort of craziness of the chief rabbi is that they have created a world in which they decide status and everybody else is not doesn't really matter so that disparity between status and identity can become very complicated and very painful i'll share with you just the following situation to which i don't have a good answer one of my students is working this summer at the a brandeis high school program uh, it's a program for arts and for some set of judaic studies and there are about 60 kids um, and they don't try to dive in together on a regular basis because it's just too complicated in terms of um, egalitarian and mechitza, all that kind of stuff. And they wanted to do Kabbalat, Shabbat, and Mariv together for their last Shabbat, uh, which was uh, last week. And so they had kind of gotten everybody wrapped around their heads that they would do like 
an Orthodox davening in terms of the in terms of the liturgy. There would be three sections: men, women, and a mixed section. A guy was going to lead davening. There'd be enough seating for everybody, um, and there were going to they weren't going to start. They had ten men and ten women, kind of making all the pretty standard sort of compromise that everybody makes. The egalitarian stuff wasn't even the issue. The problem is many of the young men on this program perceive their identity to be fully Jewish, but aren't halachically Jewish according to many of the other men on this program or the other people on this program. Whether that's a patrilineal Jew and the conservative and Orthodox Jews are uncomfortable or somebody who had a conservative conversion would had a woman on the Beit Din, the Orthodox Jews are uncomfortable, or would, or a reform conversion where there was no circumcision. There's all these complications where I don't even this a person's identity and status are so far out of whack that I don't know what to do with your Stam Jew walking in the street, your regular old American Jew, not the ten percent of Orthodoxy of which we're a part, but a regular old American Jew is just a normal American Jew who, which is that's the question that I sort of wrote up here. Which is, let's imagine this, a regular American Jewish family. They sort of keep a kosher style home. Maybe they go to shul a couple of times a year. They'll fast on Yom Kippur, host a Seder, light candles on, on Hanukkah, maybe light candles on Shabbos, but maybe not. Um, but they're like 90, the vast majority of American Jewry is not meaningfully Shomer Shabbat and Shomer Kashu. So now this family, young couple, they get married, they discover they can't have kids. They've been trying for many years. They make the very sort of amazing decision we're going to adopt, and they recommend it to adopt a non-Jewish child for all sorts of all sorts of good reasons. And they want to convert this child, and they want the, they want the child to maybe to someday be able to make aliyah. So they want to find an Orthodox Beitin to convert the child, but their home is not. They have no interest in being kosher, but they like go to the Y and they go to Israel. They're like regular Jews. So can you convert this baby? What do you do? The home isn't really kosher. The home isn't meaningfully Shomer Shabbat. How do we respond to that kind of question? So that's the question that's all on all of our minds. But none of the medieval Rishonim that we're going to look at would even think to ask this question. They couldn't have imagined your style American Jew in the 21st century. It didn't make any sense to them. Again, not to say that they were all from Jews with payas. They just weren't they would just had a, an, a sense that people sort of behaved as Jews, whatever that looked like. Um, so I want to show you the debate that exists today, where it comes from, and why there's an interesting flip of ideologies. So we're going to look at a small selection first from uh, on page number one from the, the Beit Yitzchak. Beit Yitzchak is Rabbi Yitzchak um, Schmelkis. He died in 1905, Polish, Galicianer, um, Lithuanian trained. Um, he's written several very, very significant true vote on conversion for adults and for kids. And you'll note the timing here. He's writing this at the end, towards the end of his life. It was written in 1996 or seven. It wasn't until the mid 1800s that we begin to see regularly asked halachic questions about practical conversion cases. Part of that's true because all of a sudden people are trying to convert because for the most part, in most of European Jewry, in most of North African Jewry, in most uh, most of world Jewry, it was actually illegal to convert to Judaism until after 1750-ish. So if somebody were was converting to Judaism, they were really, really bought in. The only other case that came up of conversion to Judaism, anybody know this is a bizarre reality? The other cases that come up of practical halachic like Shalot and Chubot about conversion, they're not about irregular conversions. They're actually about slaves because Jews were owning slaves and the masters were having relationships with their slaves that they probably shouldn't have been having. And they were having children with their slaves and they wanted to convert the slave and the child or the pregnant slave and the child. So the most common medieval case or question about halachic practical is actually about slaves becoming Jewish. 
Um, every so often you have a letter that the Rambam wrote to Ovadia Hager. We don't really know anything about him, which is a beautiful letter, um, but there's very few cases of normal, regular conversion that we're used to. So the Beit Yitzchak in the middle of the 1800s started writing a whole bunch of Shalots and Shavot about conversions and starts articulating questions around Shmirat Mitzvot. Because all of a sudden you have, for the very first time, a major Posei Halacha living after the onset of modernity and after the reality of the reform movement, etc. So now we have to articulate, when we say a Jew has to be a Shemar Mitzvot, what do we even mean by that? All of a sudden that question becomes the driving question, which it never was for thousands of years prior. So he now, in this somewhat significant shuva, dealing with the question of conversion, says as follows about the conversion of a minor. So page number one towards the bottom, I'll read it in Hebrew, the English is on the next page. im aviv rasha mechalel shabbat ve'ochel trefot v'imo nochrit, if his father is not so from, he's mechal shabbos, he doesn't keep kosher, and his mother is not Jewish. There was a big question as to whether or not in those cases you're allowed to do a, even just do a mila on the child at all. Not necessarily a conversion, just a mila. So what can you do? The child can going grow up in a home with a non-Jewish mother and a non shemer mitzvot father. What's the case? Lichora, presumably in this case, ain't zechut lahavlad. There's no merit in this case. Why? That if he were to remain as a non-Jew, she won't get punished for breaking Shabbos. But if he, now if he's Jewish and he's Michal Shabbos, he's in a lot of trouble. I already wrote this. You know what? It is an inherent merit to convert and become Jewish. Why? Even though a Jew who sins gets punished, he has a place in the world to come. It's not the case if he remains a non-Jew. It's a pasuk in Yeshayahu that does not speak so highly of non-Jews. I'm not 100% sure. Meaning, if you believe that Jews inherently have a better portion in the world to come than non-Jews, so then that's true even about Jews. So if you end up, I mentioned this in passing the first time, and I want to see it inside so we can understand the questions to be asking as we go through the couple of Rishonim we'll look at. That's the position of Rabbi Yitzhak Shmelkis. Rav Moshe Feinstein, in 1974, the question was written um, when he was in the, uh, he was in camp in Ellenville um, of the yeshiva of Staten Island. It was in July. Um, it's Yud Aleph Menachem Av. So it's like this time of year, Rav Moshe hanging out in the, in the bungalow colonies, and he was asked this question about a conversion of a minor. And he says, and I'm just here, I really just clipped a small sentence. And even if the kid doesn't grow up to be Shomer Mitzvot, it makes sense that it's actually a merit to be Jewish. Why? Even Jews who are not good Jews, they have the Kedush of being a Jew, and all the Mitzvot, mitzvot. any Mitzvot that they do is like a good thing. It's just like non-intentional sins. It's still better than being a non-Jew. Meaning, if you ha- if you operate in a universe in which it is inherently better to be Jewish than it is to be non-Jewish, which is typically understood as a more right-wing view of the world, it turns out that you can allow for a conversion of a minor who won't be Shemar Mitzvot at all. However, what if you have a more liberal view of the world, meaning non-Jews are good people too. Non-Jews will get their share in the world to come. They don't need to be Jews. As long as they're good, as long as they do good non-Jewish things, they'll be fine. So let's skim down here. Rav Chil Yaakov Weinberg, um, who lived uh, through the war uh, in Montreux, and uh, he died in 1966. 
He had a PhD from the University of Berlin. He was the head of the sort of neo-Orthodox community in the, the, in the Hildesheimer Seminary, a very modernist kind of guy. Uh, Mark Shapiro has written extensively about Rav Yaakov Weinberg. It's a really important figure for as a model of the type of orthodoxy that kind of speaks to me the most. The Hildesheimer Seminary is an important seminary. Um, his teacher was Rav David Svi Hoffman. Rav David Svi Hoffman's teacher was Rav Israel Hildesheimer. This is like the model, the closest analog to our type of orthodoxy that existed in Europe. In fact, little known, um, little known trivia before Yeshivat Chovavei Torah was called, had a name, the other name that was rejected was Hildesheimer. Um, we were almost going to call ourselves that, but we didn't. We went with Chovavei Torah. I think there are some donors who would have been, it was always a problem for certain donors to say Chovavei. Okay, Shruti H, very liberal guy, has nice things to say about non-Jews despite the fact that he lived through the Shoah. And here he says in the middle of page three, Vaikar, and really the main point is, there's no real inherent merit to, for a minor to be converted. Why? Especially if the parents aren't uh, fulfilling Torah mitzvot. And the child also is going to keep Shabbos if he's being raised in a house that's not Shomer Shabbos. Not only is it not a merit, it's the opposite of a merit. It's like a negative obligation. You can't cause something. You can't actually do that. Not only is it not nice, you're not able to cause somebody to receive a chov, an obligation, in their absence. And now he says something very extreme, below ode, and not only that. And in a conversion in a case in which the expectation is the child won't be Shomer Shabbat, he batla umivutla. That conversion is as though it never happened. It doesn't ever take force. The Eno Ger Klal, the child isn't considered to be Jewish, just a plain non Jewish child being raised in a sort of quasi Jewish home. Via voli de michshol, this lead to a terrible stumbling block because the kid thinks he's Jewish and he'll tell people that he's Jewish, but he's not Jewish. So the street age is the liberal thinker who believes that non-Jews are good people too; they'll go to the world to come. He thinks that the conversion only works if the child. It's only a zechut if the child is in fact going to be, you know, seriously committed to shmirat mitzvot. Now, just to be clear, you sort of never know where people land but do the best you can. Yeah, Bert. Yeah, so is this the basis for which the chief rabbinate, uh, when they sought to, uh, you know, to uh, de gayer somebody, as it were, you know, to take away the gayers, is that the basis for this? So or they had their own cheshbon? This is, this is different as we're talking about a child, we're talking about a minor. Um, but the concept of, of nullifying a, a, a gayer. What he's saying here is different. The, the chief rabbi is doing something more extreme. What the Sri Daesh is saying is that attempting to convert somebody in this setting is not, um, this doesn't work, it's not operable. He's not saying that it took effect and then it, it gets undone. The chief rabbi is saying something more radical, which is that it took effect for some period of time and now it's being nullified. He's saying that you can't convert because the mechanism by which a child converts is through the merit that is granted to them by the Beit Din. But if the child's not going to be Shomer Shabbos, it's not a merit, it's the opposite of a zechot, it's a chov. The mechanism never took place. The child never became Jewish. The, he never got onto the ramp. So it's a different kind of it's a different kind of claim. But this is a problem when it comes to regular American Jews who want to adopt a child. This position creates a serious barrier. So how, so this is the question that we're going to try to figure out is, how do we understand the expectation of Shmirat Mitzvot in the framework of adopting a child? Okay? That's the, or, or in the framework of a non-Jewish mother and a Jewish father. Okay, that, that's the question that's hard. Again, the Rishonim aren't going to talk about that because that's not their universe. 
It's not until you get to the 19th and 20th century that people start asking these questions, but I want you to see the way in which your worldview might shift. And also, the idea of a zechut, of a sort of imparting a merit, has a kind of objective force if it's if it's there. Um, that the child perhaps can be made to be Jewish in some way or another. Um, it's an interesting concept of how can you how, how does it even work uh, for a minor? Okay. So this is for to set up. Us, we're now going to do a brief review of the Gemara that we looked at last time, and then we'll look at Rashi and how a couple of commentators on Rashi go in different directions. Good. Everybody with me? So. My texts are over here, which I sometimes look over here. I apologize. So the Gemara, which we saw last time, uh, in commenting on the Mishnah that talked about the, the baby who converted under the age of three, the Gemara then immediately quotes the statement of Rav Huna, Ger katan mat bilino beitin. A minor can, can be converted along with, along with the authority of the court. So that's case, that's we'll call, Rav Huna's din is option number A, the authority of the court. The Gemara, then, I'm skipping a little bit here. That ellipsis took out a couple of lines. Maybe the Mishnah that talks about converting the baby under the under the age of three should be seen as a support to Rav Huna. As the Mishnah says, so in that case, in the case of our Mishnah with these three women, one of whom is a minor girl who was converted under the age of three, my love, is it not the case isn't the case of the Mishnah just the very same thing as Rafuna? That's the Gemara's first thought. Says the Gemara, lo. No, the case of the Mishnah is not the same as Rafuna. The Mishnah is dealing with a different mechanism. The Mayaskinan, what is the case in which this child converted under the age of three? Gairu Banav Uvenotav Imo, a convert who converted together with his parents. Why? The child or children in that circumstance is uh, content with or happy with or at peace with what his or her parents do. So these two ideas really become two different methods. There's the method of dat beitin, the authority of the court, and the method of the parents. Whose authority do you think is stronger? The court to convert a minor or a parent to convert a minor together with the parent themselves? What do you think? Meaning whose authority is more objective in this case? Oh, imagine Besden. Okay, why? Why should the, pa- the why pa- because because it has official status and has a measure of independence and are not no gay abadavra as it were. Okay, they're not invested in the matter, so the court can just sort of objectively say, "This is a merit, somehow or another." Okay, in particular, in particular, going back to one other thing, um, that uh, you know that. In terms of being able to marry, it's a benefit to the community to some extent that we talk about nowadays, because this way, at least you're going to be marrying a Jew as opposed to a non-Jew that may have a Jewish name. So, you know, that's an additional benefit, um, yeah. you know, of, 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 of having it, even if he's not Mechayim Mitzvos. Yeah. Or she. <laughs> so somebody make the argument for the parents. Why, is the, why do the parents have the objective power? Forget about forgetting about mitzvot for a moment. What does it mean to say and they're content with what their father does? That's not like it's not a halachic statement. What does it mean to say a, a child is, is content with? So let me let me let me take a stab at it. So does that mean that you know the parents have a better sense? Of wanting to, you know, benefit you know, their children, so that you know, so whatever it is that they think is beneficial, so if they think it's beneficial to convert, you know, parents, you know, parents tend to have a better sense of what's best for their kids. Okay, it's a basic. It's interesting that the Gemara here is like making a parenting claim. You don't usually think of the Gemara as like a parenting book, um, 
But in an ideal world, all things being equal, we would hope that, you know, children would want to behave in accordance with their parents' values and their parents know what's best for them. Again, all things being equal. Obviously, there are exceptions. There are bad parents. There are bad kids, I guess. Um, but there are parents who are like unhealthy. Um, but a healthy parent, healthy child. We kind of trust parents to say, this is what's best for my family. The parent says so, we kind of trust them and we believe them and we take them on their face. And if that's like a, it's an interesting concept that's not like a normal halachic statement, but something else. It's a statement of how the world works and therefore the child should just be considered Jewish because the parent wants the child to be Jewish. Okay. Okay, so now... I was only only one time in my life was I ever involved in the conversion of a whole family. It was five people, mother, father, and three kids, uh, two girls and a boy. Um, all the kids were under the age of, uh, of mitzvot. They're under the age of 12 and 13. And it was a fascinating experience. One of the kids uh, was not a good swimmer. And so the kid, it was like a three-year-old or four-year-old. Um, and it was like very hard to watch. The parent had to like shove his kid underwater, which is not a thing most parents want to do. Um, but uh, it's an interesting experience when a whole family converts. Let's look at Rashi. This Rashi, like a four-word comment of Rashi or six-word comment of Rashi, um, explodes the comment, the world of Ger Katan. So Rashi, in commenting on Rav Huna, when Rav Huna says, al dat beitin, through the authority of the court, Rashi says, im ein lo av, the child has no father. The imo heviato lihit gayer. And the child's mother brings the child to convert. So Rashi seems to think there's a difference, first of all, between mother and father. That when the when when Rav Huna, when when it says nichale b'may da avid avuhon, the child is content with the parents do. Avuhon in that sentence actually means father. And that it's Dafka, the father, that has the authority or the power to convert the child, but the mother by herself does not. And then Rashi's implication here is Im Ein Lo Av is that the default for Avhuna is that the child is showing up with no parents. Right, it sounds like what Rashi is assuming for Rav Huna is when we say the child converts through the authority of the court, we're talking about a child who has no parents in the situation. And by the way, even if he doesn't have just a father, if only has a mother, it also means that it's through the authority of the court. So now you have to ask yourself, which I said last time, what's the case? It's not a two-year-old showing up in court. It's an 11-year-old child who shows up in the court. A baby was found in the shuk. Like, what's going on that a 10-year-old kid is showing up at the court to convert? Is it that they're showing up, or once there's the, the death, and the you know, that both parents are dead, that the Besden says, well, we have to figure out what to do with this kid? Okay, so what's that case then? We have let's say the parent. Let's in, other, say, in other words, in other words, it's not that the kid has shows up at Besden. It's that the Besden says we got to figure out what to do with this kid. So therefore, what we're, we're the Jews are going into orphanages. The the Beit is going to orphanages and converting kids. <laughs> oh, I don't know. That's what I'm, that's what I'm asking. In other words, I doubt that the I doubt that many kids will go show up at Besden. So therefore, I'm assuming that somehow or another, some adults, you know, are bringing them forward. Okay, so you got some adult in the picture somehow. So it could be it could be an adoption case. Hard to imagine adoption in this universe, but adoption could mean maybe aviv or emo means biological. And even though the parents are adopting them, and for halachic purposes, at some stage we'll consider them adopted, and therefore fully the parents. Uh, maybe in the case of an adoption, it's still through the authority of the Beit Din. One way to say it. Another is possibly. Child's wandering the streets, no parents are around, a lost child, really, a, or an orphan, or a child that has no parents. Maybe that's the case that they're describing. Um, certainly, it's certainly a possibility of what Rashi was imagining. Um, why do you think Rashi would distinguish between mother and father? Why does the father here have more authority? Remember, we're talking about a kid 
Um, let's assume the child is not under three, but closer to 10 or 11. Why is it that the father has the authority, but the mother by herself would not? What does that tell you about Rashi's view of parents or parenting? I mean, he, he never met my wife, by the way. <laughs> What's he saying? Why would a father have more power than a mother? In the right. answer. Because the father has more status, you know, and has, and, you know, and the mother doesn't really do it. The father knows what's best for the kid and not the mother. Okay, fathers knows best. Maybe that's what Rashi is saying. Okay, it's not, uh, again, not a very pleasant position, but it's an important position. Um, and we're going to have to figure out, does Rashi really mean to distinguish between mother and father? Or is Rashi making a different distinction? What is important is that Rashi makes it clear that Rav Huna's mechanism of Aldak Beitin court is fundamentally different than when the parents bring them. Those two methods are functioning somehow differently. And they, each method might have ultimately have different um, implications for what that means going forward. Says the tour, I'm j- jumping from Rashi to the tour, which is a little bit unfair. We're going to go back in a moment to some earlier we shown and we're commenting on Rashi. But I want you to see where this Rashi ends up in the world of Halakha. The tour is kind of the predecessor to the Shulchan Arach, um, Yaakov ben Asher, um, 14th century uh, in Spain. Says the tour in, the, there are basically two simanim of, of all of Hilchot Kirut that appear in the Shulchan Arach. Um, one of them is mostly about Mila. Um, it's sort of ironic. Right? We, this is like become a definition to the Jewish communal discourse. And it's one ziman in the Shulchan Arach, one and a half really. Nochri katan, a non-Jewish minor. Im yeshlo av, if the child has a father, yachol legayer oto, the father can convert the child. Vim einlo av, the child doesn't have a father, uba lehit gayer, and the child, it sounds like the tour is describing a 10-year-old showing up in Beitin, megayerin oto, the court has the right to convert them. Why? Jezechutolo v'zachin adam shalo biadiyato. Because it is a merit, and it is uh, you can give a merit to somebody without their knowledge, without their awareness. So he, what he just did here is he distinct. He made it clear that when the court is doing the conversion, we need the halachic mechanism of zachin la adam shalobafanav, that you can give somebody a merit in their absence. The father just says yachol legayeroto. I'm bracketing out the question of the mother for a moment, but it sounds like the father's authority in the conversion of his child is fully objective. The authority of the court is based on zachin, based on the hope or the belief that in this case, it's a merit to be Jewish. Which could mean that when a baiting converts a child, needs to be shumer mitzvot. When a father converts his child, it doesn't matter. If the father says, I want to be Jewish, kids can be Jewish. Says the Bach, commenting on the tour in Yeridea, the Bach again, Rabbi Yoel Sirkis, um, wrote, I think we mentioned this last time a little, oh, and in a different year, sorry. But what's interesting about the Bach is the Bach lived after the publication of the Shulchan Aruch. Shulchan Aruch itself was published in 1550s. The Bach was writing in the end of the 1500s. And he decided to write his commentary on the tour, which is the predecessor of the Shulchan Aruch. Part of what he was doing was sort of thumbing his nose at Rabbi Yosef Karo and Rabbi Moshe Israelis, and saying, who do you guys think you are? You can't write the Shulchan Aruch. You don't have that authority. That's not the way halacha works. I'm going to go back to a book that's pre the publication of you guys and write my commentary on that instead. Moshe, is that a hand? Yeah, um, does it mean that the father, not the Beitin, does a conversion just uh, in terms of uh, Mila and Fila? I mean, you still need some type of a, you obviously, still, you need a Mila. So, I presume, therefore, you need a Mohel. And you also need the presence of Beitin, but the Beitin is there 
in, it sounds like in the Torah's description, the Beit Din is there not for the kid, but for the father. But the, the Beit Din has to just do what the father wants him to do. Uh, yeah. But, the kid. Yeah, correct. He still needs a Mila. And still needs a Tfila. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I guess, yeah. So it seems like. And so that, again, it's a very different mechanism than Aldat Bezdin is Nikolai by David Abu. It's like a totally different conceptual model. Says the Bach, explaining uh, explaining the tour in Yerodea. Maim read the Ravuna Barakam with the Ktubot. This is the this is the language of Ravuna from the very first chapter of Asachar Ktubot to Milashon Rabbeinu, and from the way in which the Torah formulated it, Yireh Afilu Ein Lo Aim. Even if the, if the, even the child doesn't have a mother, Ela Shabam Yatzmo just came by himself. Vahad Katav Rashi, and that which Rashi had said. The emo miviato lihitkader and his mother lihitkader. The mother brings him to convert. Love Davka. He doesn't mean mother specifically. Meaning the tour is saying, don't think that Rashi's distinguished between mother and father. Rashi's just saying a parent. He doesn't mean to be so specific. Rather, what's the purpose of Rashi? Atila Uruye is coming to teach me. Da'af al pisha imo miviato, even though his mother is bringing him afilu hachi. This Moshe was maybe your question. Afilu hachi ba'inan al dat bezdin. You still need to have the court's presence. The dafka kshaha av mivio lo ba'inan dat beitin. Oh no, this is your point. If the father brings him, you don't need the authority of the court. But the mother by herself doesn't have that same authority. Um, and therefore, the last sentence of Al Be'imo Miviato, Baye Dat Beitin. If the mother brings him, the court's authority needs to be part of the mix in some way or another. So there is a distinction to be made between mother and father. It's just a question of the authority of their court. If the father converts the child, or if the father and the child convert together, I don't need Dat Beitin. And when you say I don't need that baiting, what you're meaning is I don't need it to be some type of a zechut, i.e. shmirat mitzvot, as opposed to the presence of just the mother, I do need that baiting. I need it to be a zechut, and I need to have shmirat mitzvot. Yeah, Moshe? Just one more thing that in terms of the, the shuvot of Rav Moshe and um, Rav Shmokas, what about the fact that at La Ulam Habba there is a zechut, even if there's no zechut now? How do, how does these fit in, or do they fit into what this is saying? Yeah, so the, the Rav Moshe seems to think that the, the, the zechut is just being a Jew. The three D H seems to think that that's not enough of a zechut. But the three D H's point is that well, they also get non Jews get Ulam Habba too. Rav Moshe and Rav Yitzchak Shmelkes are saying, really, Jews get a better portion of the world to come, and 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 therefore, even if you're not so Shomer Shabbos, you'll still get that zechut. So for Rav Moshe and the, and the, and the Bez Yitzchak, the zechut is is objective, even when it's through the through the eyes of the court, because it's just better to be a Jew. So that's what they would say, even in the case where the court's doing it, it's always an objective. Or inherent zechut, because it's better to be Jewish than it is to be non-Jewish. But if you don't so believe mezak, it, so mezak and adam only applies if there's no father or parent, even if you would say. Correct. And now we're going to. So now, now the the Rashba, um, similar timing to the to the tour, is again. This is commenting on the Gemara. You'll notice, by the way. I went from Rashi to the tour, which is the halachic work, and the Bach, which is the commentary on the tour. But there aren't like medieval chuvot because these don't exist. So we're looking at Parshanei HaTalmud and trying to use that to make sense out of halacha, which is sometimes not quite fair. Says the Rashba, source number four, page number six. Commenting on our Gemara and Ketubot. Perish Rashi Zal Shehevi Says Rashi, the mother brings him. 
It's not to say that in the absence of a mother or a parent, we don't immerse the child. Beitin doesn't need to go out and actively seek to immerse and circumcise random non-Jewish babies. That would be a bad idea. <laughs> By the way, um, the general the rule is that when a family is adopting or fostering, adopting, and, and converting, you don't do the conversion until the child's fully adopted, because there are circumstances where the adoption process gets started, takes weeks, months, years sometimes, and it doesn't always work out for any number of possible reasons. And so you don't want to convert a child and then they get sent back into the foster care system. So only once in today's practice, only once the child has fully 100% adopted by the parent, the Jewish parents, um, do we permit actually doing the conversion. And that can take time. Um, and the Rashba here is saying, we don't go out and actively seek to just convert random babies. Okay, that's a, that's a good reminder. <clears throat> Next paragraph of the Rashba. The Af Al Gab, and even though the Atilis Yue Mematnitin Ubidachinan, even though the Gemara quoted the Mishnah in support of Rav Huna and then rejected that and explained that the Mishnah is Begershnit Garu Banav Uvenotavimo, the case of the Mishnah is not that Beitin, but a whole family system. Lo Shiehe Chaluk Badavar. It's not to make a distinction between mother and father. Because if it was just a mother and her children, all the children here means not just sons, but children go according to the mother, not just the father. Ella, here's the key. Khan, in Rav Huna's case, when you need dot beitin, why is it that you need dot beitin? Shehaviato, the parents are bringing the child, velo nit gaira, but the parents or the mother is not herself converting. The hatam, the way the Gemara explained the Mishnah, shehavio vinit gairimo. The huadin, the whole family is converting together. The huadin lei laem the nichalu lemeavad ma'ida aviravuhon o iman. Kids want to follow their fathers and or their mothers. So the Rashba explains Rav Huna's case as one or two non-Jewish parents bringing a child to court and converting their child, and they remain not Jewish. Now, I don't know exactly what that looks like, but I'm pretty sure that home is not going to be as Shomer meets vote as yours or mine. Two non-Jewish parents who want to convert their child. I don't know exactly what's going on in these parents' minds, but that's the case. And according to the Rashba, the Beitin has the authority to convert a child with two non-Jewish parents or has one parent and that parent is not Jewish because the father's out of the picture somehow. It's such a bizarre case. I don't think we can imagine it, but the case of the non-Jewish mother and the Jewish father who want to convert their kid for a number of reasons is not so far-fetched. And so if the Rashba thinks that the Beitin can convert a child who has only non-Jewish parents, if the child has a non-Jewish mother and a non-Jewish father, it seems like the kid's way ahead of the game. All the more so in that kind of a case, you can convert such a child. That's one of the major, major debates today. Can you convert a child uh, into, a, into, a, into that kind of system, into that family, into an intermarried family, um, both in terms of a non-Jewish mother who gave birth or an intermarried couple who's adopting? Either one of those cases. Yeah, Rabbi Edelman. <laughs> uh, Rabbi Fox, is my sound working? Okay. So about 35 or 40 years ago, I had a non-Jewish couple that came to me with two small children, a four-year-old little girl and about an 18-month little boy. 
um, the, the adult father, so no one is Jewish. The adult father had been circumcised as, as a baby um, and only needed to have um, just a minimal. Um, so I, and I arranged, I arranged with uh, an Orthodox Moel who um, did the circumcision that was needed both for the father and for the 18 month old child who also had been um, circumcised at, at birth. Um, so the, my question became, now that all four of them now were interested in converting, the, the mikvah that I arranged was not an orthodox mikvah. There were only men on the, on the, on, on the, for, the, for the mikvah. And they were as observant as I had in the congregation. But I'm sure that there might be, there was, there was then question, I would have questioned exactly, well, since you drive to shul, that means that you're not Shomer, Shomer Shabbat. Um, so they were converted through Hatavadam, Mikvah. Um, they sold their house and moved uh, to live around the corner from the shul. Uh, and the house that they bought um, had been owned by a couple in the congregation that had two sinks, two dishwashers. Mm -hmm. um, Kashrut became very important. Um, they became involved with the synagogue. The children went to the Solomon Shekta school, went to Camp Ramah. The mother uh, taught a little bit at Camp Ramah. The mother eventually, at the age of 60, retired from being a public school teacher and was accepted at the Jewish Theological Seminary for Rabbinical School. She became the president of the sisterhood and the president of the shul and involved. So today, and I have now subsequently uh, officiated at, the, at both of the weddings of the children. Um, the daughter is married to a chazan and, uh, and the son is active in the synagogue also. So the, my, my only, my question or my circumstance that I think about now is, wait a minute, is it, was, was all of this not halakhic because of the status of the Beit Din <laughs> at, that, at that, particular, that particular point? She yeah. is now a part-time uh, rabbi um, in a small synagogue in East Mauritius, Long Island. So... <laughs> So this is why the, the contemporary controversy isn't about who is a Jew, it's about who is a rabbi. Right. Uh, what I would say, which you've heard me in the past, what I would say is as follows. If you tell me, because I know you and trust you, that the three men who sat on the Beit Din uh, were Shomer Shabbos, I would trust that person and that family is fully Jewish. Um, that's what I'm interested in. Were you a kosher Beit Din at the time? Were they Shomer, was everybody on the Beit Din kosher, Shomer Shabbos at the time? If the answer to that question is yes, then I would fully accept those people and all of their full, as, as a full Jew. Now, uh, after after the, the 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 adult wife, after she went to to, to, to mikvah, I then officiate I then officiated at the, at a chatuna. Uh, for them again. Uh, for for them at that point, and when the when the daughter was getting married. She also went to 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 mikvah before before that chatuna, um, so would that retroactively have any effect? So I'll say I'm gonna I'm actually gonna pause the recording right now. Okay, let's finish with one last source. Um, if you didn't, if you missed the part where I turned off the recording, you got to come live to hear the good stuff. Says the Ritva, the very last source. Um, the Ritva is the last verse, page number seven. This is extremely important, both for the conversion of minors and for the conversion of adults. It's like one sentence in here, and the Ritva sort of throws a bomb into the whole system of conversion. It's on this basis that the contemporary debate about Shemirat Mitzvot actually um, unfolds. 
Says the Ritva, Vahai de Matbilin Oto, that which we immerse a child, Af al Gav de Ger Alma, even though, as a general rule of thumb, an adult convert, Bainan, requires Sheyodi Uhu Kalot Vachamurot, an adult convert needs to be taught some of the light and some of the heavy mitzvot. You have to know the mitzvot to convert. However, hahi, the requirement of learning the mitzvot, and I would add into that mix, committing to the mitzvot, le mitzvah. It's great, it's beneficial, it's wonderful, it's certainly better. Velola akev. But its absence does not create a problem. Meaning, v'hachan, for the child, the lav bar hoda'ahu, you can't teach the kid about Shabbos and Kashrut, v'chulei, v'chulei, can't learn it, ain't no ma'akev, it doesn't get in the way. Meaning, he's asking a very important question. If shmirat mitzvot and hoda'at mitzvot, if you need to spend two years in your conversion course learning Shabbat and Kashrut in the Jewish calendar and tefillah and chesed and stakah, and all of those great things. Well, how can a child do that? It's just not possible. The child's a minor. He's not able to learn those things. He doesn't have the required intellect to learn those things. Not that he's not smart enough. Bert's grandson could all, of course, learn these things. But it's not a bar mitzvah. He doesn't have the halakhic intellect. However, says the ritva, it's good. If you convert, you should know as many mitzvot as you can. But the truth is that even for an adult, that's le mitzvah, the lola akev. It is preferable, but his absence does not get in the way. So this is important in explaining the mechanism of a child. How can a child who doesn't have the intellect become Jewish? But it's also significant because he's explaining that the whole notion of becoming Jewish which at some level is about knowing and committing to behaving as a Jew, i.e. mitzvot at one level or another. So ideally you should know all the mitzvot. But if you don't know any mitzvot, that's also okay. So that sentence has, much ink has been spilled on that sentence. Right? For our purposes, it's extremely important in explaining the mechanism of Rav Huna. Yeah, actually the first half of this, of this ritva, of this comment, it's almost the very same as the Rashba. Ritva is a student of the Rashba. It's almost the same uh, word for word commentary. And then he adds a sort of this Al Gav point, this Derach Agav point of what about Kabbalah Mitzvot? How does a minor accept upon him or self Kabbalah Mitzvot? He doesn't need it, don't worry. Not only that, not only does a minor not need it, an adult also doesn't really need it. They should have it. You should know the Mitzvot. You should know about Shabbat and Kashrut and Nidan and Tfilah. But if you don't, it's also okay. Um, that's the this ritva is, is so significant, both in terms of the mechanism of a minor, but also the expectations of of an adult. And so when you put all this together, I think part of what we're seeing is that ironically, this three day H that we looked at at the beginning here is more machmir, has a higher standard or threshold to become to convert a minor. Because his expectation is that, or his understanding of the universe is that you could be a regular good non-Jew, be a good non-Jew, it's fine. Be a good Christian, be a good Muslim, whatever it is. Um, and it's not an inherent zuchut. When you look at Rav Moshe and Rav Yitzhak Shmelkes, and when you look at the Ritva and the Rashba and all these guys, what they're basically saying is that the question to ask is not necessarily, or isn't explicitly, or isn't only Will the Bisham or Shabbos? The question is, is this what's healthy for this family in this current circumstance? So when you have a regular American Jewish couple who are, you know, not committed to mitzvot in a meaningful way, they want to adopt a child, they want to raise that child Jewish, is it better for this family to have a Jewish child? Probably. It seems like it's better for everybody to be of the same religion and then it's ultimately better for the rest of the community. And it's better if we all would actually accept all these conversions, including the ones that Rabbi Edelman does. Because how much better would the community be if the circumstance that I described this last Shabbat in the Brandeis community, where they couldn't figure out a dab because they don't know who's Jewish anymore, is, is like such a mess. Now that has to do with more with patrilineality than it has to do with conversions, but it's also conversions. Um, and it's conversions of one generation or two generations ago. 
So those are the kinds of questions. Now, what we're going to do is use this framework to look more in depth. I pro will probably look at two different sort of lengthy chuvo or more lengthy chuvo about conversion. Um, Rav Cook, again, often thought of as the more liberal, who's going to be fairly stringent. Maybe we'll look a little bit at Rav Moshe. Um, and then the more lenient, lenient position, we'll see how that plays itself out in terms of the sort of contemporary field. If we have time, I might also show you kind of the English standards that are expected by the RCA and by some other um, other rabbinic, contemporary rabbinic organizations and how they kind of try to massage certain sets of issues. Um, like for example, what when we say we, we want the child to have Jewish education, is Solomon Schechter okay? Let's say the child has learning needs and can't go to a Jewish day school. Now what are the possibilities um, in kind of the real world? Okay, my son should be off his bus soon. Yeah, question. Thank Marcia. you. Yeah, just, yeah, one question about a non-Jew. Does does the age of bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah apply to? Oh, it's saying uh, as the, when you said a child is a child could be two years old if it's a non-Jewish child, or is it, you know in terms of bar dat or whatever you want, however you want to define being to a bat mitzvah. Yeah, I think it's twelve and thirteen. That's an interesting point. I never really thought about like is the bar bat mitzvah age the same. I don't see why it should be. Different. I mean, what did the seven mitzvot and they know apply to a child? <laughs> right. I assume the seven mitzvot are only mishum chinuch until they're twelve or thirteen. I guess. I think I don't know. Okay. Okay. Let me. I, and I'll also, if you, if you want, I can tell you a story. First, Please. basically, when I first moved to Riverdale, Rabbi Weiss had a, a family that was, I think, conservative, but not completely shemem mitzvot, obviously. In that, in that case, and they wanted to adopt a child, and he asked to teach, you know, to, to, to work with them, to teach them a little bit about Yahadut. And I think at the end, um, maybe I wasn't good enough, but he, he, Rabbi Weiss decided not to convert the child, and they went to, a, I believe, to a, a conservative um, baked in. Hmm. Yeah, History. I, Rabbi, Weiss, Rabbi Weiss has gone through a journey on the conversion stuff. It will be interesting to, I never really asked him, like, because the in part his own journey, but also because of the Tsaris that he experienced. Um, also, I think in the old days he used to do conversions with um, like Bernie and Hillel, or I don't know, maybe Milton U. Like it wasn't it wasn't always with rabbis in the Beit Din. Like it was very different in the seventies and eighties, the way it worked. It was yeah. more of a wild west. <laughs> Okay. I just thought I would. I, I you reminded me of that whole story, that whole incident with me. Um, yeah, it's fascinating. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.